What's up, everybody? Welcome to this very first live edition of The Adapted Lens. I'm your host, Jason Girallo, and today I want to talk to you about something a little bit different than usual. So a couple of weeks ago, SpaceX decided to launch another one of their Starlink missions. It was a night launch, which is really cool. If you've never been down to the Cape or to the coast to see a night rocket launch, it is absolutely spectacular. I love going there. Even if I don't have my camera with me, it is just something to see and to hear. And quite frankly, it's it's unlike anything I've, I can ever express. or, or It's just amazing. So uh, first off, if you've never done that before, Get your butt to the coast. Go see a rocket launch. They're coming up uh, so frequently these days. Uh, it's really very cool. Uh, that being said, I did take my camera this past time and took a few photos, and I wanted to show you all how I post-process my night launches. All right, so we're going to hop into Lightroom here. All right, so welcome to Lightroom. That is me in the corner down there, which is pretty awesome. This is my first time, so I'm pretty stoked about this whole experience. But as you can see, I took a couple of pictures that night. Uh, this was just the two that I actually ended up with. There were some others that I were doing to just sort of test the exposure and things like that. Uh, but what we have is on the left, the actual rocket launch. That's this here. And then on the right, we have uh, a sort of a standard static frame that we will use later for blending. And so uh, first off, uh, we'll compare some of the stats on these uh, two photos. So the first one taken at ISO 200, actually both of these were taken at ISO 200. Um, this one was for 175 seconds. So it's a pretty long exposure, several minutes long, because the launch, of course, takes a long time from liftoff until it disappears out of sight. Um, and then also this was shot at 8 millimeters, which on a Micro Four Thirds camera means 16 millimeters at f20. So really, really closed down aperture. Uh, yes, diffraction does sit in on a Micro Four Thirds camera even earlier than f20. Of course, probably somewhere around f11 or so, this lens starts losing some sharpness. But I wasn't really worried about maximum sharpness in this shot. What I really wanted to make sure was that I did not blow out the rocket trail, as you can see. Uh, rockets leave a bright red or orange glow as they leave Earth, and I didn't want a bright white one. So for me, the key there was to make sure that I didn't expose or overexpose the rocket trail. The second photo I took uh, just moments after that launch ended uh, was also taken, like I said, at ISO 200, also at 8 millimeters. I did not touch the tripod at all. That was really key. Make sure if you have a remote shutter release or anything like that, that's a great way to ensure that you don't bump or move the tripod at all. Uh, this shot was taken at f4, so the lens is at f2.8 to f4. I closed it down just one stop from 2.8 to 4. And instead of uh, 175 seconds, this was only a 30 second exposure. And so these two photos are going to come together to create what I consider the final image. Uh, so we'll start by processing the first photo. As you can see, because it's such a long exposure, we have some star trailing, not unusual there. Um, we also have, of course, uh, just a little bit of overexposure there, but nothing uh, that we couldn't recover. Uh, you can see uh, just from the word flagler, it's a little bit softened, and that is uh, mostly from diffraction. I was focused on the pier, which was close enough to infinity that I knew I was going to get both the pier and the rocket fairly sharp. So what we're going to do, not going to actually touch any of the levels or anything like that. For this shot, really the key is to get rid of these streaks. And now I'm not going to go through and get rid of every single solitary one because it would take me a long time to do that. Uh, this will just give you a good idea. And the reason I'm doing this, uh, there's also a few hot pixels around, is so that when we composite the image, we don't have uh, solid stars in one photo mixed with star trails in another. It would look really wacky. So just going through and cleaning up a little bit. And Lightroom is really a great tool for this. It's not really the best at cloning and healing and stuff like that. But for something this simple where I'm just kind of removing some blemishes and spots and stuff like that, Lightroom does just fine. And uh, I, no doubt ha I have no doubt that the final image will probably still have some light trails and some streaks. If I were doing this for a final product for real, I would probably spend quite a bit more time cleaning up any of the possible streaks that are seen throughout the image. So we'll just go in a little bit here and see if we're missing anything. Um, pressing the space bar allows me to move completely freely and then when I let go I go back to my clone stamp tool or my healing tool here in, in uh, Lightroom. I really wish Adobe would work uh, to make the Lightroom healing tool a little bit better. 
Um, it does okay for things like uh, sensor dust, but not the best for um, more complex healing issues. You really still need Photoshop for that. And the other thing you'll notice is there's an awful lot of speckles in places where you wouldn't expect to see stars, like down here in, uh, in the water area and uh, along the pier. Um, these little uh, blue lines are actually shrimp boats um, that are moving, but these little red and bluish specks are actually hot pixels. Um, hot pixels are basically um, malfunctioning pixels in the sensor uh, that don't really show up in general unless you are uh, doing what I would consider to be a super long exposure, and 175 seconds I think definitely qualifies for that. Uh, generally, uh, you wouldn't see these quite so severely uh, for something like a 30 second exposure, uh, but for something as long as 175 seconds, it does become pretty apparent that there's a lot of hot pixels uh, in this camera. And it is not the end of the world. I don't tend to make exposures that long that often. If I were shooting full frame for this shot, it probably would be a lot cleaner. There would be fewer hot pixels, uh, but that is just sort of a side effect for the smaller sensors. Uh, it certainly doesn't mean you can't get a good result. It's just something to be aware of. All right, well, I think that is probably good enough. We might still see a few star streaks going through when we actually do our final. Uh, there's one more right here that I'm going to get. We might see a few more star streaks when we do our final process, but in general, I think that looks pretty good. All right, we'll go back to fit. And then the other image uh, you can see is in general pretty a lot cleaner. So if you look through here, you really don't see, uh, you do see some streaking. 30 seconds was really pushing the limit as far as how long I could expose this. But I wanted as clean of an ISO as possible. Um, and it did give me plenty of stars to work with. So overall, I think that was a good choice. Um, I probably could have done 25 seconds and gotten away with just a smidge less star trail blurring. Up in the corners here, you can see there's some stretching and things like that. It's also not the most perfect optical lens, so there's always going to be just a slight bit of stretching, especially on uh, something so wide like that. Uh, although, fortunately, this lens doesn't tend to have a ton of um, halos and stuff like that that you have to deal with, uh, with stars that get wings and stuff like that. It's a fairly clean lens for that. So uh, anyway, this, this photo I think is in general a whole lot cleaner than, than you might think for something that's micro four thirds um, at this exposure length. And because it's only 30 seconds, notice you don't see the hot pixels or anything like that mixed throughout. It's a whole lot cleaner than the other shot was. Uh, for this, I'm really just gonna do a couple of things. I'm gonna bring down the highlights in uh, that just really for to, to bring back some detail in that uh, this storefront here, uh, boost, just a little bit of shadows there just again to bring back a little bit of detail in the wood um, and then uh, i'll add a little bit of texture not too much and a little bit of clarity again not too much that really is about it i don't want to add too much or push the pixels around a whole lot because uh, again with a smaller sensor you don't really have quite as much latitude to mess with things uh, but that looks pretty good to me maybe just a tiny little bit of contrast uh, that looks fairly good. Uh, up the exposure just a hair. Yeah, so okay, that looks pretty good to me. Um, all right, so what we have here is our uh, slightly edited and cleaned up launch, and then we also have that uh, second exposure. So I'm going to take both of those and we're going to open them in Photoshop as layers. And so Photoshop should automatically launch. It has every time I've done this, but of course you never know. Now that I'm live, things go wrong. And there it goes. All right. So as Photoshop loads these two photos, you'll notice that the regular photo is on the bottom and the one with the rocket trail is on the top. Um, now you can spend some time if you really wanted to um, masking out the rocket launch and and getting it to blend but I have a simple trick for you that makes this super duper easy and that is just change your blend mode to screen boom now you have essentially blended the two photos together and you can see if I would have spent a little bit more time cleaning up you can see there's just a few little streaks here and here that I did not catch we can clean them up here if we want to just uh, go into uh, the healing brush and just kind of paint these out in Photoshop. No big deal. I won't spend a ton of time fixing this, but just 
to give you an idea that it's not all lost if you didn't do it in Lightroom. You can definitely do a good job in Photoshop if you wish. And it does make it a little easier to see some of them because some of these trailing uh, stars are so faint that you may not see them in Photoshop, especially with a darker exposure like that. And then once you add the screen, it all of a sudden becomes fairly apparent. Now, the nice thing about doing it this way is that if you try and erase a star that's on the underlying layer, when you're messing with the top layer like that, nothing happens. See that? Nothing actually happens because it's not, uh, that's not the layer you're working on. So I can go through and easily clean these up and not worry about messing with the stars I actually want in the picture, which is kind of a, a nice little bonus there. So I'll just go through and uh, one of the downsides, again, when you do this method, you can see there's all that those noise and hot pixels are popping through, which is kind of a bummer. But when you zoom out to 100 uh, from 100 percent or, or more than that to sort of screen viewing distance, you can't see them. And because they look like points of light, uh, like everything else in the sky, when you have a starry photo, it kind of just blends together. So we're going to ahead and save that. And we are going to head back to Lightroom when this finishes saving which Photoshop for some reason lately takes just a longer time than I ever expected to to, um, to save, but that is okay. And now we're back in Lightroom. And again, this isn't the best composed shot. I kind of was actually expecting the rocket to come up a little bit higher over the horizon, so I would have had a little bit more streak in the sky. Uh, it's funny when you're there in person, it looks like the rocket is flying far, far longer in the sky than it actually exposes to. You can actually see sort of where the rocket disappears uh, when the when the engines decide to quit or whatever uh, their separation happens. Um, and in some launches, you're, if you're fortunate enough to see one where they do a flyback to uh, the landing cape, uh, to the landing pads at the cape, you'll actually see a second bow of, of uh, flame come down and do a touchdown. We were hoping for that, but uh, for this uh, launch, they actually used the drone ship. So it landed like, I think, 40 or 60 nautical miles off the coast. So unfortunately, there was no way we were going to see uh, the landing trail, although we did hear uh, a little bit of a sonic boom as they as they uh, came through the atmosphere and landed. Uh, it's pretty amazing, even as far away as we are, we're you know more than an hour away from the Cape. Um, you can hear uh, some of the larger launches going off. Uh, I don't believe you hear the Falcon 9, but when they launch the Falcon 9 Heavy, you can actually hear uh, the sound from Palm Coast, uh, Flagler Beach area, all the way from the Cape. So that's pretty amazing. Anyway, uh, just a few last little bits and pieces here. Um, we're back in Lightroom. I'm uh, going to just continue to raise the shadows just a smidge. I want a little bit more of the wood detail there, and we'll pull back some of the highlights. Don't want to do too much because we're going to mess with the uh, rocket glow. But otherwise, that just gives you kind of a quick idea of what uh, to do when you do uh, capture rocket images. So if I were you, I would consider to shoot uh, two images or more. You can actually stack multiple images even beyond just two. Uh, if you were to do, say, an HDR of the uh, clean images, you know, one underexposed, one properly exposed, one overexposed to get even better uh, performance from your sensor, and then just stack that rocket shot on top. You can certainly do that. But with a two-shot HDR like this and just using screen mode, it's a super easy way to get two shots together, and I think it looks just perfect. Uh, just one more full screen shot of this, and you can kind of poke in and see. It really does look pretty clean, um, even at uh, ISO 200, but with a smaller sensor and a long, long exposure. Um, pretty happy with this image, and um, I would probably crop this to 16 by 9 or something like that uh, because I do wish the rocket did trail a little longer. It's kind of the challenge with rocket photography. And so that is kind of one of the fun things when you're shooting a rocket is that uh, you don't necessarily know the exact flight path. So uh, when it goes up, you're hoping you've lined your camera up correctly, uh, but sometimes you may not, and it, you only get one shot at the apple. So it's, it's kind of a fun way to do things. Uh, but uh, anyway, I hope that this inspires you to go out and take some shots if you are in the area where rockets go up. Otherwise, plan on taking a trip to the Cape. We are going to be sending men uh, back to space from Florida in the near future, so it's a pretty exciting time to be into rocket photography. Uh, and with that, I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Adapted Lens. Uh, please like, share, and if you haven't already, consider subscribing. I do appreciate it. I also now have a Patreon, so if you like the content that you've been seeing on the Adapted Lens, please consider supporting me on Patreon, and I'll see you next time.